Hello, welcome to my presentation on the in-depth analysis of area. Now, we're going to connect the ideas of area to something much more complex, the integral. We're going to see uh, the area definition of integral and how it connects later on to its antiderivative form. So to begin with, we're going to start with the most basics of areas, and that is in this case with a rectangle. So, in a basic rectangle, as we have learned, or as you've learned before, the area is just base times height, right? And I think about this as one of the most important areas because you can actually derive other area formulas from this one. So, if you cut it in half through its diagonal, and if you see what you get, you get two equal area pieces. In this case, they look like triangles. They're three sides. Oh, they are triangles, but because you divide the you divide it into two equal pieces it's a division of two so the new area of each individual piece as you might have guessed is base times height divided by two or one half times base times height now the idea is that the triangle comes in different forms and classes and th there's a scalene equilateral isosceles right but now the thing is that you can get a general uh, polygon and then just divide it into rectangles for example um, if we get an octagon, eight-sided figure, we find its center. We can divide it into many triangles, and no, no matter how complex it is, even if it's a if it's a non-standard uh, um, polygon, as long as it's a polygon, we can actually uh, derive, um, break it up into smaller pieces. Usually, the rectangle and the and the triangle, and then we can find its area. And keep in mind here that the area is exact, but have you ever asked yourself, what about the areas of squiggly lines, things that break the rules of polygons? Uh, for example, uh, curves, like a circle, finding the exact area on, on, under the circle. Or let's say, a uh, uh, football-like shape. How do you find the area of these? Well, the, the first pioneers in, in this were, were the Greeks. They use a for, uh, form called the exhaustion technique. And now, as you might have guessed, you're pretty much exhausting the space. For example, I'll give you first a uh, geometric representation of what I mean. So here we have um, a parabola-like um, cup. And what the exhaustion formula says that, okay, there are curved lines. We, uh, we're not trying, oh, actually, we are trying to find the exact answer, but although we might not get to it, let's try to be as precise as we can, or as accurate. So what, what they used to do is get a simple geom geometric shapes and then just filled all, and just filled the spaces with these shapes. In this case, I'm filling it with rectangles. Now you see that the, the exhaustion formula, uh, all these rectangles, if we actually calculate their areas and then add them up together, we'll get a rough estimate to what the actual area under this curve is. But there's one important fact that we're missing, and these are these gaps. These gaps right here represent areas that we're not taking into account. Now, remember, the bigger the gap, the farther away you are from the actual precise uh, area. And, of course, our main goal is to be as close as possible. So, <coughs> I'll draw a zoom in here so you can exactly see what I'm talking about. This rectangle right here, they have these gaps right here. Although, they might be minuscule, depending on the figure. And I'll show you how we can actually manipulate this. These areas do actually exist, these gaps right here. And they do change the, the nature of our, of our response. Now, now... Our main focus is how do we reduce these gaps. Now to do this, you might have noticed that if we get the same problem right here, just trying it smaller. Now if you cover it with more rectangles, you see, now you see this is why this is called exhaustion. The more rectangles you have, the less space these gaps have to form. Because we're here, let's call this A and B. A and B. We're going from point A and point B. These are the same distances, but because we're using more rectangles, there's less space for the gaps to form. So, now you see that the gaps are almost minuscule, although they do exist, they're minuscule. Well, let's take this a step further. Let's get rid of these gaps completely. Well, to do such a thing, we'll use the following. We'll use the limit. Now remember, the limit you were 
you're able to use it to define um, instantaneous rate of change. Remember, uh, although you can divide by zero, you can approach it very close and it becomes very, uh, very convenient. For example, if you have two points here, you want to find the tangent right there. You draw a secant line, right, and then you approach this line, and then it gets closer and closer, right? You're approaching a limit. This value right here, the, the difference was h, and you want the limit as h approaches zero. Well, we're going to use the same technique, but we're going to use this limit definition to approach an infinite amount of these rectangles. So we can achieve what we want, and that is the reduction or the complete reduction of these gaps. So let's actually start. Let's get an actual problem. So let's say we have same problem. I'll use a geometric representation so we can have a better idea. Um, let's say for for now the function is going to be negative x squared. Yeah, negative x squared. Actually, let me get an easier one. So let, let's actually use a very, very simple one, x squared. x squared, we're going to be uh, mainly concentrating on the right side of the parabola. And let's go from the origin, or x equals 0, to, let's say, x equals 2. Right? So the area we're actually looking for is under this curve and between the axis, x-axis. We're looking for that. Now, how do we find this? So we're going to use the exhaustion method and then apply the limit and then we're going to see that we actually get the exact answer. Well, b before we get all cool and everything with the idea of the limit, we first must uh, actually understand the basics. B before we go into the limit, let's actually, instead of uh, getting an infinite amount of rectangles, let's first uh, get a certain amount of rectangles. And then you'll see that there's a certain difference, although slight, it might, it's very good to understand what they mean. There's a left and the right orientation, or endpoints, or whatever you might call them, but it's the same thing. So, if we have um, the following, right here, simple parabola, the, the right side of the parabola, x squared, and let's say we're interested in finding uh, the area from 0 to 2, right? And then we divide this into three rectangles. Now, I'm going to draw the rectangles right now. Actually, I yes, I am into three rectangles with the same width right here same width now let's actually draw, draw the rectangles so you there's two ways you can draw these rectangles you can draw them depending on your orientation now this is where the left and right come from so if we're interested in the left orientation we simply look at the left of, of this specific rectangle and we choose whatever the height is at that point you see in this case the height is zero so, this specific rectangle will have no height. So, let's look at the second rectangle. The height, well, it has some height right here. And then, that height determines how the rectangle is going to look. In this case, it will look like this. And then, in the third rectangle width, we look at the left, we use that height. Alright? Now, let's actually draw the same function in the same style of finding the area but in this case the only difference is that we're interested in the right okay same parabola okay this is zero this is two divided into three and now we're interested in the right in the right side now you see that right here that that height is different from here it's not zero but it has a certain height. But we do see that it passes the function. And then for the second rectangle, it has a height. Oh, that's a bad rectangle. And then for the third rectangle, it has a, a height in the right side as well. We look at the right side, oh, that's the height. So, you see, same problem, same function, same graph. Uh, the only difference is the left and right orientation. And you get drastic consequences, you get differences. In this side, the left, you get these gaps that are not uh, represented for. They're missing. And then in the right side, here, you get these uh, overestimations that need to be taken away to get the actual area. Now, 
please don't think that uh, the left always uh, does this and the right always does this. It depends on the nature of the function, I'll show you. But um, d just know, in certain consequences, the left and the right might give you an overestimation or an underestimation. But in either case, one of them will do one, uh, one of the following. So, now when you actually approach an infinite amount of rectangles, you will see that th these gaps right here will get smaller and smaller and smaller. The, the gaps will go down. And here, these overestimations will also go down. And because these arrows are going to the same place, we can use an infinite limit definition. And it doesn't matter if we use left or right side. So, uh, what does matter is uh, which one's more convenient. Because they'll all approach the same thing. Uh, uh, a closer approximation to what the actual area is under the curve. So let's actually do the same function and with an infinite definition. Now that we now that we know that or, that orientation does matter, we can actually uh, have some awareness of this. So we're going to draw same function. So uh, parabola. We're only interested in the right side, uh, y x axis. Here's point two. Here's zero. And now uh, we're going to use the right side. Actually, yeah, right side, should I use the right side? Yeah, let's use the right side, because uh, graphically, it's much easier to represent. Alright. So, these are my three rectangles. We're not going to use three rectangles, but graphically we are. So, uh, so, so you can see how analytically we go to infinity. So, the idea is that area, area equals base times height. That is the formula for an area of a rectangle. Now we're going to use the exhaustion method, the one that, that the Greeks developed, combined with the limit definition to see how we can actually uh, get the a actual area under a curve. So let's actually start. So we're going to use an accumulation. So we're going to sum things up. In this case, we have three rectangles. One, two, three. And let's actually call this one uh, rectangle one, rectangle two, rectangle three. What's the if we get the areas of these three rectangles and add them, we get a uh, sort of a, of a close approximation. Then we can come up with a general formula and go directly and get the infinite one. So let's actually take into account the first the rectangle. The area of the first rectangle is what? Just the base, which is from here to here, right? And then the height, which is from here to here. Now, what does the base represent? How, how do we get the bases? And the base is just the width of the rectangle. But now, in this case, oh, I forgot to say a very important detail. Let's keep the widths of these three rectangles the same. Now, why did I just say that? Well, to find the widths of these rectangles, I asked myself, oh, okay, the length from 0 to 2 or from wherever I'm interested. In this case, it's from 0 to 2, the length is 2. Now, if you want to divide this into three equal rectangles, in this case, it's going to be 2 divided by 3. Now, I made them equal because so I, so I can make that statement, div divided into an equal amount of rectangles. In this case, 2 over 3rd. So each rectangle right here has the measurement of 2 thirds. So right here, 2 thirds is the width. And then we just need to calculate the height. So the height, in this case, we use the right orientation. That way. It's just... Um, it's just actually calculating the what the function is at that width. For example, if we if we use the width of two thirds from here to here, now I have to calculate what the height is at that point right there, right right here, that height at two thirds. So whatever the function is at two thirds. In this case, lucky for us, we do know what the function is, but sometimes we won't. We'll see that later. So we're gonna we have to plug that into x squared, two thirds squared. In this case is. 4 over 9. Okay, good. We have the height and the width for the first uh, rectangle. Now let's do the same thing. Uh, we'll speed up some arithmetic here. Uh, second rectangle. Now a very important thing is that the width, now there are two widths right here. Right here from, because it's from, uh, <coughs> uh, actually yeah, sorry, there's only one width. I was already thinking about the height. So the width is always going to be the same, two thirds. Now, but we actually have to think about the height the height right here. But remember, the height is related with the function. The function doesn't care in which rectangle number you are. It just needs a certain x value. Now to get that x value, you need to know how many accumulations of widths you have. Now I say this again. 
I chose equal widths because when we have equal widths, for example, if I'm in the second rectangle and I'm like, what distance do I need from zero to that second rectangle? I say, oh, second rectangle, two rectangles, two widths, just multiply it times two. So in this case, two widths, which gives me four thirds, tells me that the distance from zero to the second right side rectangle is four thirds. Now this is what I plug into the function and I get 16 over 9. Right? And then I do that for the third rectangle with, once again, two thirds and the height accumulation of three rectangles in this case. Three two thirds gives me just two. So in, in this case, the x value from 0 to 2 is just 2. Now we just have to plug in 2 to, to the x squared and we get, what, 4. So, we're actually going to calculate all of these um, multiplications and then add them together. And although it looks tedious now, we'll actually see how we can simplify this. So, we have 4 over 9, 2 thirds, 16 over 9, 2 thirds, 2 thirds. Now, if I actually write this in a piece of paper, you'll see how much easier this can get. So we had 4 over 9, 2 thirds plus 16 over 9, 2 thirds plus 4, 2 thirds. Now we can extract this 2 thirds right here and then just add 4 over 9 plus 2 thirds, ah, my bad, 16 over 9 plus 4. So, 4 plus 16 in this in case gives us 20 over 9, plus 4, uh, common denominators, remember, 36, add them up, 56 over 9, Simpl okay, so this is simplified, and then we multiply times whatever the width was, 2 over 3, in this case you get 27, 112. So remember, 112 over 27 represents the actual area of these rectangles, purple rectangles. That's the approximate area because uh, that doesn't, uh, remember here we have overestimations but we at least we do know uh, as, you, as, you, as we have seen that this is an over approximation. The area is going to be less than this. Let's actually go and find the actual area. Now that we have some practice of how we've accumulated things, let's go to the limit definition. So we're going to deal with the, uh, with the same problem. I'm draw my x and y axis. Here are x. Here's my y axis. I'm going to draw the same problem. x squared. And now, same with 2, 0. And in this case, I'm going to draw three representative rectangles. But in this case, we don't have three. Analytically, we're going to have infinite amount. to the right side for convenience all right so let, let's actually start area equals to base times height now like like we've seen there we can actually um, how, how should I say we can actually factor out the, the width and then just keep the function so for example uh, in, in the following in, in the in the previous case, we had the following problem. Do you see how I factored out the widths? Because the widths of the rectangles are going to be the same. If they're kept constant, here there's two-thirds. And here it's just a function. So this is just the function, whatever you put in inside. And this is just going to be the width, which is constant. So if you multiply those things together immediately, you'll still get the answer. So let's keep that in mind. Function represents a certain output, or in this case, a height. And then the width right here, so I'll write width and height. Now, um, here we have a, a, a height and a width. And now th this will give us an approximation for one rectangle, but we want many of them. So we're going to write sigma. Sigma, uh, I'm going to write right here a variable i equals 1 to n. We'll see what that actually, what that actually means. But for now, all you have to understand is that the sigma tells us that we're going to have a summation of multiple rectangles and of here a certain height and a certain width. So now you can see how we're going to get a, a certain amount of rectangles, which is 
jam pack them and multiple uh, amounts of them. So let's actually start. In this case, x squared, we're interested from 0 to 2. <coughs> so let's actually find the width. In the previous case, the width was 2 over 3 for each rectangle because we had three pieces. But in this case, the distance from 0 to 2 is 2, but we don't know how many um, rectangles we have. We're going to have a certain amount of rectangles. So let's keep it as n. The width is going to be 2 over n. The distance from 0 to 2, 2 divided into a certain amount of rectangles, and n meaning a certain amount, that's the n. Now, the width uses the same idea. So, like like we've like we've done before, the height depends on what in this case because it's a function it depends on what the width is, or what the x the x value is, and the x value is what the width is. So, what I mean is is the following. So, if we have the first width right here, right, we, this gives us a certain x value. In the geometric representation, it looks like two thirds. It is two thirds. That'll give us some height right here. And if we put this into the function, in, into the f function, in this case, we'll get four thirds, four over nine. My bad. So it's the same idea. We're going to put something into this function, and it's going to be the width. And the width is, in this case, is two n, right? But it's an accumulation of, of widths. Now, but the accumulation depends. Sometimes we're interested in the first uh, accumulation, the second accumulation, uh, first rectangle, second, and so on and so forth. So we actually have to introduce a variable for this. It's going to be i. Now, what does this mean? So, for example, if I want to find the height at the third rectangle, right here, at the third rectangle, I see that I have an accumulation of three rectangles right here. One, two, three. So, uh, here we're going to have two-thirds. This is geometrically. Remember, this is not what we're actually doing. This is so you can have an idea. And then you just add two-thirds, two-thirds, two-thirds. In this case, you are adding 2n plus 2n plus 2n, which is the same thing as saying 3 times 2n. 3 being when i equals 3, but we want a general term, so that's why we use i. So what we're going to put in, in this case, is actually 2n times i. <coughs> so now, here we have it. This, the following, will predict uh, what the area is for any amount of n. But let's actually uh, write what we actually want. We want an infinite amount of n. So limit as n approaches infinity. Now this is where it gets very interesting. Hopefully you've done uh, sigmas before, and let, let's actually get into this. Let's simplify it. Uh, with sigmas, we know that uh, we can extract the constant term. The width is always going to be the same for each rectangle is the same width. So we can extract the width. So we have 2n. Uh, please keep in mind that I'm not going to be writing the limit, the different, and the the limit symbol every time just to save space. I'll will write it in the end. Sigma i equals one n function 2n over uh, 2 2 over n times i. That what the function is is x squared. So let's actually put this in into x squared. We get four because two squared over n squared i squared. All right, here we have a sigma, and we write 2n again. And I'm not going to write n i equals 1. We'll do that when we actually calculate that part. So now the parentheses disappear. And now the only variable here that we have is i. So the rest, 4 and n, we can actually extract that. So we're going to extract it. Here's what we had originally. We extracted a 4 over n squared. And we have sigma i squared left. Now, let's actually simplify the constants we've extracted. And I'll get my second paper here. That simplifies to 8n cubed. And then we have sigma i squared. Now, if you haven't uh, checked my summation of squares video, because that is a nice proof. I'm pretty sure no cal uh, almost no calculus teacher explains where this comes from. But... If you actually calculate this, you get n, n plus 1, 2n plus 1. I really recommend watching that video because it'll, it'll amaze you. So, if you simplify sigma i squared, in this case, remember, remember i equals 1 to n, you get uh, the following formula. n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 divided by 6, where n represents the amount of rectangles. So, this is what we actually evaluated. 
and this is what the constants were. We're going to join them right now. And now we're actually going to write the limit right now because the limit is going to turn out to be very important right now. So let's actually just uh, mo mo join like terms. Uh, not like terms, just multiply things out. Uh, that's n squared plus n. Just doing the first part. Okay, time to join this. Um, 2n cubed plus n squared plus 2n squared. Hopefully you're not having algebra problems. Uh, that's 2n cubed plus 3n squared plus n divided by 6. Alright. So now that's all nice and clean, and uh, not yet. Uh, we have to simplify the 8 and the 6. Remember that we can divide in the top by 2. That turns out to 4. 6 divided by 2 it turns out to 3. And now let's actually write that right here. We have 4 over thirds. And now we have 2n cubed plus 3n squared plus n divided by n cubed. For the terms of, of this exercise, so let's actually divide uh, the variable the end by by its respective term right here that cancels out right here that's uh, 3n and right here that's plus 1 over n squared I just divided the top by the bottom get the following plus my little my times my constant term and now time to apply the limit I'm going to write it right here it's not customary to write it here but it'll do so the limit of this function as n approaches infinity. Now what does this mean? Where do we see the ends? Well, the ends are located in only two spots in this case. One and in two spots. Now, what happens if, in this case, in the bottom, n is very big, very big. For example, uh, let's do this mental exercise. One over one, one. One over two is one half, which is 0 0.5, right? 0 0.5. And then let's say uh, one over four, okay? A quarter, 0.25. Now, do you see how this value is actually going down? If I give you uh, a 1 over 10, 0.10, you see how it's going down? And in all the, all these cases, it will start going down because of the denominator. As the denominator goes down, the whole value goes down. So, what happens if that, and you know, we're talking about here from going from 1 to 2 to 10. What if you go to infinity? Oh, remember, infinity is not a number, it's just a concept. So, you're going to a huge concept. The value becomes insignificant. Point zero 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 zero. Oh, you can't. You'll never stop talking about zeros. This will cancel out to zero. This will cancel out to zero, and you're left with what? Two times four over three. Simplify it, and voila. That's the exact area. The exact area which we were looking for under the curve from zero to two. That's it. Eight over three. And when you look at that, all because we just did a simple limit definition. Okay, well, hopefully you've enjoyed this exercise, and we'll go into the antiderivative explanation later.